first um, sing what's on the screen, and if you hear me singing something else, don't worry about it. It's how it's supposed to be. Okay, so you, you sing what's on the screen. I'm going to help you out with that the first couple times through, and then you're on your own. Okay, and I'm going to sing something else. But first, we have Tori to play the flute. Yay. Amen. <laughs> all of you here this morning. Welcome to all of our guests. We're also glad to have you with us uh, here in person, but also joining us online as we worship our Lord and Savior today. Uh, if you do happen to be a guest and would like to know more about our family here at Lutheran Church of Our Savior, please feel free to ask any of the people around you here today or contact the church office. We'd greatly, uh, uh, we'd love to be able to spend some time with you and get to know you a little bit more and share uh, a little bit about our family with you. A couple quick uh, announcements. Uh, this coming Wednesday is our last midweek Lenten service. We have uh, service at 5 o'clock and then uh, around 5.45 or so we head over to Fellowship Hall for a soup and salad supper along with desserts. Uh, this coming week we have lots of sal uh, soups on the schedule. Uh, but we're looking for another dessert or so. So if you'd like to do that, there's a sign up just behind the technology booth there out in the hall. We'd greatly appreciate you doing that. Along with that, 
Uh, today is the last day to sign up for Easter flowers. So if you want to help decorate the sanctuary for Easter, please do that. There are lilies and hydrangeas. Um, again, on the sign-up table, right behind the technology table. Uh, and if I didn't mention it, right behind the technology table, there's a sign-up table there, and on there is an opportunity to sign up for Easter breakfast, because on Easter Sunday, we're gonna have a 6.15 sunrise service. It's gonna be starting outside, and depending on weather, we'll move inside. Um, then at eight o'clock and at 10.30, we're gonna be having our Easter festival services, but in between, at 9 o'clock, we're going to be having Easter breakfast together. So there's an opportunity to sign up for some egg casseroles out there. We need some potato casseroles and some baked goods. So uh, sheets are out there to sign up for that. Also, if you would, if you're planning on attending, please sign the other sheet so that we kind of have uh, a ballpark figure of how many to expect. If you happen to not sign up, uh, we're not checking IDs at the door. Um, we'll still have plenty of food for you, but please feel free to join us for that. Also, on the table right behind the technology thing, there is a little flyer out there, too. It's for a game day luncheon on April 30th. It's a fundraiser for sand dollars. Uh, lots of different games that includes a lunch. Um, but if you don't like to play games, you can come just for lunch. I heard there's going to be plenty of food, and it's a, a, a big thing, and so lots of good food. So sign up for that as well. Check that out. Um, uh, those forms go right directly back to Willa Jones. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, okay. I think that's anything. Everything, anything else? Okay. If not, we will um, continue our worship. Uh, we've been talking about parables uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, parables are stories that use common everyday things that we know about to reveal deeper truths. Uh, and Jesus, as he went about proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, um, because his kingdom is so hard for us to understand, uh, Jesus told us what the kingdom was like by using parables. Uh, through those parables, Jesus hopes that we can gain some deeper knowledge about what the kingdom is like, but also so that we could hopefully have a deeper faith walk with Jesus into his kingdom. And so we've been looking at different parables, and today we're going to be looking at the parable of the worker in the vineyards. And in this story, Jesus uh, not only shows God's love and patience as he calls and longs for us to join him on his mission, uh, he also shows us God's grace, uh, how God has freely given um, his grace to us and wants to share that with everyone, even though uh, we don't deserve it. And so we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in our message today, but in the meantime... I want to invite you to stand as you're able as we begin our worship with our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather to worship you today, we pray that you would help our hearts to be open to your leading. May all that we do here in this place bring praise, honor, and glory to your holy name. May we be enlightened by your love to live as you would have us live out each day. Thank you for the gifts that you so generously provide to us each and every day. And help us to realize that, that the gifts you give are worth far more than we could ever hope for or imagine. Through, though we don't deserve any of it, Lord, we thank you for them from the bottom of our hearts. We pray that you would enable all people to receive the gifts that you so generously give out, especially your gifts of love and grace now or, or even at their last hour. For we ask it in the name of the one who made it all possible, your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We begin our worship today just as we began all of our days in the Lord at our baptism 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our opening song. of peace and yet too often in our lives we know that we're selfish selfish and feel as though we deserve more than we receive and so let's pause to confess those sins of our hearts and lives to our Lord who hears and forgives we pause as we reflect
Most merciful God, we confess that our very nature is sinful. We do not love you with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. We do not love our neighbors as ourselves. Far too often we feel as though we are slighted and deserve more than we receive. We are mistaken when we think that we ought to make a great gain for simply doing what we have been called to do as your children. By our selfishness, we have sinned against you and against others in thought, word, and deed. Forgive us, most holy God. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to take upon himself that for he did, which he did not receive. He took on our suffering and death as a punishment for our sin and our selfishness. Because he did what he did not deserve on the cross, we get what we do not deserve. Forgiveness, life, salvation. Receive now the priceless gift that he paid for. All of your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our readings. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will be given decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the young yearlings together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with a bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. <clears throat> what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For it says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scriptures say to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he has mercy, and hardens on whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? So what does one say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does the potter have the right to make out the same lump of pottery, of clay, some pottery for special purposes, and some from common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, or with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepare for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. Gospels from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. 
For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? <clears throat> because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when <clears throat> those came who were first hired, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend, did you not agree to work for Denars? Take your pay and go. I want to give the ones who hired glass the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Having heard the good news last, confess our faith with the affirmation of faith. I believe in one God, united on high, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, full of grace and mercy. I believe in the Father, who has created me and all that exists. I believe in the Son, who has redeemed me by his death and resurrection. By my baptism is in his name, I am saved from the sin.
Heavenly Father, you are the potter and we are the clay. Mold us, make us, use us. Fill us with your spirit. Guide the words of my mouth and the direction of our hearts and minds that they might be impacted by the words that you speak to us today. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's what Jesus came to proclaim. That was his message. That was his ministry. That's what his whole mission was all about, impacting God's world with God's kingdom. You know what? The way God thinks, the way God acts, his will is so different from ours as human beings that, that his kingdom, uh, what it is and what it looks like, is really hard for us to kind of grasp and understand. And so to try to give us a glimpse of what God's kingdom is really like, Jesus often describes it uh, by using parables. And because the kingdom isn't what we'd expect, what we often discover in the parables uh, that Jesus is telling is that they're countercultural. They go against our natural way of thinking and against our society. They, they're different. His kingdom is different than what we'd expect. And that's because... Uh, the world or kingdom that Jesus is describing is so radically different than anything we know or could even imagine. That's the only way we can probably come to understand some of those passages like the ones we read this morning from Isaiah chapter 11 where it says things like the wolves and the lambs and the leopards and the goats and the calves and the lions who are all going to live together peacefully. Because, you know what, from our experience in life, that doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't. It's completely different than anything we know or can even think of. And because of that, because everything is so radically different in God's kingdom, it means that sometimes, as Jesus is telling us these parables, these stories about what it means and what it looks like, it stings our sensibility. And it makes it hard for us to accept. Jesus' words has, has ways of stepping on our toes and hurting our feelings. They may even cause us to become upset and walk away from him just mad when we hear it. Take, for instance, the concluding words of the parable of the vineyard today. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? To get at what Jesus is really trying to tell us, we're going to take a closer look at this parable. And, and we know... We, we're familiar with it, right? It's a pretty simple, straightforward story for the most part. At 6 in the morning, the owner of the vineyard goes down to the local temp agency and hires the crew of workers that's there because he's looking for help with his grape harvest. And he agrees to pay them a fair wage for a day's work. Work for a denarius from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And everybody's happy with that situation. Well, about 9 o'clock, he sees that there's still a great need in the harvest. And so he goes back down to the temp agency and hires everybody who's there at 9 o'clock. And he does the same thing at noon and at 3. And they're out there working and toiling. And even with all of that help, the harvest is so good, so bountiful, that around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he feels that they're... He needs to try to bring on some fresh blood, some, some additional workers to try to get the job done before the day's over. And so he, he goes back and hires all those that are still there at that time. He wants to get things accomplished. And the sting of the parable comes when it's pay time. 
the end of the day, everybody lines up. And to everyone's surprise, those who came at 6 in the morning get the same as those who came at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. They all get paid the same amount. One denarius, as promised, when they were each hired. Even across the board. Well, naturally, the crew that came at 6 a.m., who put in a full 12 hours work, who worked through the heat of the day, well, when they saw the latecomers getting a denarius, they thought they were going to get more. But instead, everyone gets the same amount no matter how long they work. You know what? It isn't a coincidence that Matthew puts this parable in his gospel account just a few verses after Peter is asking them, um, where Peter asks Jesus, he goes, you know, we have left everything to follow you. What will there then be for us? In other words, Jesus, we've given up everything. We left our businesses. We left our families. We made you number one in Vin following you. So what's in it for us? And Jesus responds with amazing promises, including eternal life, but he also turns things upside down for his disciples by saying, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then he goes into telling this parable. And this parable stings. It hurts. And it's meant to. It is supposed to cause us to think and question our attitudes and understanding about things because in God's kingdom, that's not the way we operate. They all get the same pay, even the ones who only worked an hour. Hasn't Jesus ever heard of you get, you uh, pay what you earn? It's like if somebody went to high school for, uh, say, just a month, and they're there for a month, and they then walk across stage at graduation day and receive the same diploma as a, the student who's been there for four years putting in all the hard work. It wouldn't be fair. Or maybe it's, maybe you've had this experience at work. Somebody's hired in new and you've been there for a long time. They've been there about three months and all of a sudden they get the pay raise and promotion that you've been striving for for a long time. It doesn't sit well with us, right? We get upset by those things, right? We should get what we deserve. We should get paid for what we've earned. Equal pay for equal work. It's the principle of what our U.S. society is based on, isn't it? Our whole economic system. But into that, Jesus says these words. The vineyard owner says, don't I have the right to do, with, do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And that's the twist that Jesus throws in there. Jesus says those words and they cut deep because they challenge our way of thinking about things. And he does it because he's trying to teach us something about God that we don't necessarily want to hear and we certainly don't understand. And it doesn't help then that on top of that, he adds in that same phrase again that he said to Peter. So the last will be first and the first last. And what Jesus is saying is that in God's kingdom, there's a different order of things, a different way that things work, a different way of thinking. In God's kingdom, things aren't focused on our rights and privileges. Hear that again. Things aren't based on our rights or our privileges. They're not based on what we think is fair. God's kingdom isn't about what we think is right or just. Because whatever we get from God is up to God. It's his choice about what he gives us. And since God is God, and sorry to say none of us are, 
We're not. I think we know that. We don't get to question how he distributes his riches of his kingdom. It's like the words from Romans say, God gets to decide. So I, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And we might not think that that's fair. In fact, we have a tough time thinking that it's fair that some horrible, no good, very bad person who's left a huge wake of destruction in their path all of their life, now at the end of their life, finally comes to faith. And everything is leveled out between them and the person who's devoted their life to serving as a Christian, working hard and faithfully in, in God's kingdom for 50 years, all because of God's grace. But you know what? It doesn't really matter if, if we're sinners that come late into the vineyard or if we've been serving in his kingdom all our lives. By God's grace, we all find our place in paradise just like that thief on the cross next to Jesus who found it in his last hour. See, from our perspective, from this world's perspective, God's grace isn't fair. And guess what? Grace isn't fair. Grace isn't fair at all because none of us actually get what we deserve. What we get is given to us by God's grace. And there's certainly no way that any of us could have ever earned it. God simply chooses is in his infinite and unimaginable love to give it to us. All of it. Forgiveness, hope, life, peace, security. He gives it all to us freely. On our part, it's unearned. It's undeserved. And it isn't fair. And it never will be fair. God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense is so unfair and so unjust that we, all we can do is accept it. Because God's own perfect son, Jesus, gets the rejection and the ridicule and the torture and he's put to death as the wages, his day's wages on Good Friday for what we have earned, what we deserve. That's his compensation. That's what he's paid for a lifetime that was lived in perfect obedience and submission. And it isn't fair but it's God's choice, not ours. God chooses to lavish his love on you. And after hearing all of what God has done for you, what he's offering you, his amazing and sweet sounding grace, if, if you want to take all of this and do something about it, then do what? God did for you. Do the unsettling thing. Do, do the countercultural thing, the, the unexpected thing, the gracious thing. Go and serve. Go and love somebody. Love a child. Care for a neighbor. Give somebody more than they've ever dreamed you would or could. Love your neighbor. And that's anybody who God puts in your life's journey just because God loved them. And God loved you. And as you go about living day to day, remember this. Even though you and I certainly don't deserve it, God continues to lavish his love on us, his unending, unsurpassable love. And he does it for us simply because that's who God is. That's what God does. He is love. 
and he loves. He does not treat us as our sin deserves, and that's grace. It's life level. It's unsettling. It's amazing. It's counter-cultural. It's counter-intuitive. It goes against what we think or what we ever expect, and yet that is grace. And he pours it out on us freely so that through his love for us, we <coughs> can impact his world with that same love. So that we can turn this world upside down as his kingdom comes through our hands and feet, through each of us each and every day. I pray that it may be so. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now may the love of God guide, guard, and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for the life everlasting. Amen. amen. At this time, we come before that loving and gracious God to not only thank him for all the blessings that he's given us, but to also lift up all the cares and burdens that are on our heart. He invites us to do that through prayer. And so as you're able, please rise as we come before the throne of our Heavenly Father. At the end of each petition today, I'll be saying, Master of the Kingdom, and you'll respond with thank you for your grace. God, who gives us all that we need, Remind us always that it is an honor to serve you and, and labor in your kingdom. It's a privilege that you invite us to come alongside you. So forgive us for thinking that we deserve any of the good gifts that you give us. And enable us to appreciate all that you do for us and the blessings that you give to others. We thank and praise you for the blessings that we ourselves have received, and we ask that you would help us to use them to be a blessing to others. Help us to walk alongside and encourage and help those who are homeless or hungry, those who are lonely or afraid. Lord, help us to be your instruments of grace, mercy, and peace to them. Father, we thank you for the blessings of life and love that you give to us, and we lift up before you Sherry, Renee, Anne, Colleen, and Tori as they celebrate their birthdays this week. We also lift up Bertha and Joe Scott as they celebrate their anniversary. Be with each and every one of them, as well as all of us here today, that through the time you give us in this life, we would experience your love and mercy and share your love, grace and mercy, forgiveness and understanding with all those that you put in life, in our life's way so that they too might come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Master of the kingdom, Thank you for your grace. God who gives us everything we need, all the kingdoms of this world would not exist if it weren't for your allowing it to be so. And so we ask that you would Use the leaders of all the kingdoms to bring your mercy to all people so that the world would experience peace and live without fear. Father, we lift up the leaders of our country and ask that you would help them to serve humbly and seek your will rather than their own. Help them to acknowledge your power and your grace rather than their own. Father, we pray for leaders around the world that they would stop war and that your peace and love would break out among all of us. Master of the kingdom. Thank you for your grace. God, who gives us everything we need, it is your will that all people come to know you, to know the salvation that you give through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lead all of your people to be your servants, to serve faithfully in your kingdom, and share your love with others in our thoughts, words, and actions. Master of the kingdom. Thank you for your grace. God, who gives us everything we need, your kingdom welcomes all those who are weak, ill, and suffering. 
And so we ask for your grace and favor to be upon those near and dear to us who are in need of healing, especially we lift up before you Sherry Savage and Larry Purdy, who will have surgery later this week, as well as all those we name before you now. Father, you know all those on our hearts. You all know all those who need your healing touch. Be with them and their families through this time. Remind them of your continued presence. And according to your will, heal them and give them the gifts they need to be made whole. Master of the kingdom. Thank you for your grace. God, who gives us everything we need, we remember before you all those who've gone before us in the faith who came to know and serve you at the beginning, middle, or end of their lives. We lift up before you all those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Give the peace that goes beyond understanding to all those who mourn. And thank you for the gifts those people were to us and enable us to be gifts to others so that they might come to know you here in this time and for eternity. Master of the kingdom. Thank you for your grace. God, who gives us everything, confident of your love, we place all of our prayers, all else that you know we need, as well as all of our loved ones, before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy through Jesus, who taught us to pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have a gracious and loving God who, even though we don't deserve it, we haven't earned it, he lavishes his love on us. He loves us beyond anything we could even comprehend or think of. And in that love, we live in this world. We are, and through us, his kingdom come. His kingdom comes to this world through us. And so as we go about living out his love each and every day, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We sing our closing song, How Great.
is who we are. We are God's dearly loved children. And in that love, we continue our worship as we break apart here even to go back out in the world living out each and every moment serving our wonderful Lord and Savior. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.